We'll just read first, and we'll see if that thing opens up. If not, we'll just wing it without our notes this morning. How about that? Amen? My computer ain't playing along this morning. That'll be all right, though. It'll be a real short one, brother. Amen? Hallelujah. We ain't got no notes. So won't it? All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning there in verse 1, and we're going to go ahead and read down through. We're going to just go ahead and start there in verse 1 because we're going to catch up with what we, what we looked at last week. And uh, and we're gonna we're gonna read down through verse 11, and then we'll pick up verse 12, and we'll just go down through verse 21. All right, let's go ahead and read there through verse 21 this morning, chapter 12, beginning verse 1. It says, "Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Ye know that ye were Gentiles, carried away under these dumb idols, even as ye were led." Wherefore, I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost. Now, there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but all is the same God which worketh all. In all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit of the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, and to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one and selfsame spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, Behold, I am not the hand, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, Because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it not therefore not of the body? If the whole body... Were an eye, where, where were the hearing? If the whole were the smelling, hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body, as it hath pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? And now are they many members, but yet one body. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of thee. And we'll just stop right there. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father in heaven, Lord, I come before you this morning and I need you. Lord, I especially need you. Lord, I, I my notes are gone this morning. It's just me and you and the scriptures. And Father, I pray that you, Holy Ghost of God, you remind me of the things that I studied and the things that I prepared. And Father, I pray you'd help me to preach now. Lord, I need you. And I rely on you, Holy Spirit of God, take control now and use me. And Lord, remind me to, to, of the things that, that I prepared to preach. Lord, I, God, I just put myself in your hands now. And I ask you to take control. Lord, lead me and guide me. And I'll give you the glory. I'll give you the praise. And I'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, praise God. Well, that went all my notes, so hallelujah. Well, this will be interesting this morning. Amen. I have a lot of sub notes and things, and that's all gone. So we're just going to roll with it. Amen. Well, let's look at it this morning. Again, in verse 12 there, we're talking about the body of Christ. The Bible says, For as the body is one, and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. And again, we, the church, is the body of Christ. Amen? It's, Israel is not the body of Christ. The church is the body of Christ. Christ has set it up that way. We read in Ephesians chapter five, and we read about we read about husbands and wives. We see that Christ 
represents the husband in the home. He's the head of the home. And the body is represented by the wife. The church is represented by the wife. And as the church is subject unto Christ and everything, the wives are to be their husbands, and the husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church. And we've seen all that. So he said, as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. He says, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, or have been made all have been made all made to drink into one spirit. Now what in the world is that saying to us? First of all, we see here again that the body is one. Amen. Now I have a body, you have a body, we all have a body. We understand that our body is made up of different members. Again, the Bible, the Bible is telling us this in this passage. Paul is using the anatomy of a person to describe the construction of a church, how God has put a church together. He, uh, listen, my members are, are all different. My hands function differently than my feet. I can't feed myself with my feet. I see people who, who don't have arms and they learn, they develop to do that. There's a woman uh, named Joni Erickson. I think she used to paint with her mouth. She painted with her toes. I can't remember she painted with something. And, uh, you know, she was famous for doing that. But, again, my hands, my hands work differently than my feet. My hands work differently than my ears, my eyes, my nose. And so God gave me these different pieces of, of a body that are all put together and make one body. Amen. So is his church. Amen. The body, the Bible says, it hath many members and all the members of that one body. Again, my hand is, is it, it, it does unique things. It functions different as the rest, but it's still a part of the same body. Amen. Even though my feet walk, my hands reach. They all they're all functioning part of that one same body. The Bible said, and and we are we being many are one body, so also is Christ. So we have many members and we make up one body. So the body of Christ is made up by many members. We had a man up here last Sunday who stood up there and half of y'all understood some of him and the rest of y'all went, what did he say? But you know what? He's just as much a blood-washed child of God as me or you. Amen. He's from another part of the world. He grew up in a different part of the world under different circumstances. But he came to know that same Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And because of that, he is just as much a part of the body of Christ as you or I are a part of the body of Christ. Amen. Verse 15, uh, 13 says, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. <clears throat> the moment that you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, that very split second that you trusted Him and put your faith in Him and what He did for you on Calvary, that He was dead, died, that He was buried, and that He rose from the grave, that very moment, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, the third part of the Trinity, took you and baptized you placed you into that mystical body called the church. And you became a part of that body. Amen? Forevermore. Nothing can change that. Amen? When we are, we're sealed, the Bible says, by the Spirit of God unto the day of redemption. We have been placed like a brick in the, in the wall on the outside of this church many, many years ago when they put brick around this thing. They placed one brick in there. It's been there ever since. It's a part of that wall. Even though it is a brick, it's a part of the wall now, which is a part of the church building. Amen? And the Holy Spirit placed you, when you got saved, into the body of Christ. Did you know you, even though you might not have yet joined a church body, it doesn't matter. When you got saved, immediately you were part of the body of Christ. Every church is a local body. But amen? But we're a part of that same body of Christ. The Bible says whether we be Jew or Gentiles, doesn't matter. Amen? When, when, you know what? It doesn't matter. There were people before before Paul came along. There were plenty of people. Jesus said, Upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You know, you know there are a lot of people who think the church started, the church started uh, with Jesus and the disciples walking around. They think the church started uh, when, 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 when on the day of Pentecost, or some believes that, that some people believe the church started when the Apostle Paul began to preach. Well, I tell you, when I believe the church started, I believe the church started with Jesus Christ. Amen? I believe the church started when Jesus Christ died on the cross, was buried, and rose from the grave. And the, and the veil of the temple split from top to bottom. When God opened up the way for man to come to Him, I believe that's when the church started. Amen? And, and in that moment, 
There were no Gentile believers. There were no people believing on the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior the way they believed now during the, the age of grace, during the church age. <clears throat> so he said, well, they were Jews or Gentiles. So at first it was only Jews in the church. And then God, and with the stoning of Stephen, when, they, when Israel turned its back on God, then God said, okay, I'm done with Israel for now, and he will be done with Israel until the tribulation period. So during that span of time is known as the age of grace, and this age we live now in, the church age. And so Gentiles freely came into the church. They believe on Christ. The Bible says whether we be bond or free. Brother Krupa last week talked about those people over there in India whose grandparents and great-grandparents were making bricks all their life. I mean, that's, they get up in the morning, they go to making bricks. They, go to, they, they get done at night, they go home and go to bed, they come back and they make bricks. They do it every day of their life until they get too old where they can't do it anymore. Their great-grandparents did it, their grandparents did it, their mom and dad did it, they'll do it, their kids will do it, and their grandchildren will do it if Jesus doesn't come back first. These people have nothing to do but make bricks all day long. What a life. What a miserable life. That's all you have to look forward to. You're born into bond labor, slave labor. The Bible says whether we be bond or free. So those people there, listen, they're just as free on the inside. They're just as much a part of the Lord's church as a man who lives in a, in a castle somewhere who doesn't have a little finger his whole life if he trusts Christ. But I can tell you it's more likely that fellow making bricks to trust Christ than that fellow living in a mansion. But it doesn't matter whether we be bond or free. We're all a part of that same body. Amen? But you would think, well, if that's the case, if you've got people that are born in slave labor and you've got people who are born free, surely the ones who are born free would be worth more to God than the ones born in slave labor. No, God said it doesn't make no difference what, you, what your circumstances are. It makes no difference where you came from. Amen? We've all, we've all, we've been made all to drink into one spirit. That's a little weird terminology. To drink into one spirit. But I'll look at it this way. It's one way you can maybe understand that. All the rivers in the United States, where do they wind up? They wind up in those, you know that. Right? It's all, and you know what, where the water all comes from? It comes from the ocean, it rains, and it comes back down. We're all tied into the same Spirit of God. In other words, what it's saying. We all get our, we all get our sustenance, we all get our power, we all get our love, our mercy, everything. Everything that God sends us flows to the Spirit of God. We all receive from the Spirit of God. We're all connected to the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God lives in every believer, regardless of your situation in life, regardless of where you come from. There are, listen, hear me good, there are no first class citizens in the Christian family and there are no second class citizens. We're all equal at the foot of the cross. Amen? You say, well, some people got more talent than the other. I know that. That happens that way. God does that sometimes. But let's look at that. For the body is not one member but many. And if the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not in the body? Well, no. If the foot, the foot doesn't talk, but if the foot could talk, and it says, you know, I can't open the refrigerator and get the, and get the jelly out and get in the cabinet and pull the bread and, 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 and open the peanut butter and make a sandwich. I, I can't do what the hand could do, so I must not be important like the hand. I ain't part of the body, but yes, it is. Because you couldn't walk the refrigerator without the foot. Amen. It's important too. Amen. You could walk back to the aisle without the foot. You got to have it. Man. One ain't more important than the other. And the Bible says, "If the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I'm not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body?" The ear says, "I'm not. As if, I can't see. I'm not as important as the eye. I can see colors. I can't hear colors." The eye can differentiate between things that the ear can't differentiate between. You know, they say seeing is believing, right? They don't say hearing is believing. They say seeing is believing. So the eye must think it's more important than the ear. So it's kind of like a question. Would you rather be blind or would you rather be deaf? Which one's more important? It really doesn't matter. They're all important. Amen? I, I can't say I'd like to pick one or the other to lose. I don't want to lose any of them. I think they're all important. 
and very crucial to life. Paul goes on to say in verse 17, if the whole body were an eye, can you imagine that? Pleased to meet you. Wow. Think about that. That'd be odd. <laughs> meet so or so, it's just an eyeball sitting there. I mean, that's what Paul would use absurd language to, to give us a give us a point. He said if the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? How would you hear if you didn't have but an eye? And if the whole were the hearing, where would the smell? How would you smell? You know why Paul puts that in there? Because for 11 chapters, he's been dealing with people who thought they were more important than others. He's been dealing with people that thought because of their position in life, because of where they, their family they were born into, or because of their past, they have more status in the church than other people. And because of who baptized them, who they, who preacher they, what preacher they liked, or, or whatever, that suddenly they're more important than others, and a lot of them talk down against the Apostle Paul. So not only are they looking down on each other, they're looking down on the one who brought them. So he's saying, you know, how, how are you going to say you're more important than somebody else in the church? Amen. How are you going to come up and think that you could... Uh, again, I have, I have a good friend. I think I've told him before, but I tell him again. I have a good friend. I haven't seen him in many years, but his name's John Button. He's from Las Vegas. And him and his family lived out there, and he was a he was a uh, an executive for uh, I want to say well I want to say it was Texaco, but it may not have been Texaco, maybe it was Exxon. It's one of the big oil companies, and uh, and he was a brilliant guy. Visited his house one time. And he got a whole shelf full of calculus books. I couldn't even imagine reading one. I couldn't imagine reading a pamphlet on it, much less reading a book. But he was very very smart. Made a lot of money. They do it real well. They belong to this big big non-denominational church out in Las Vegas and they put on this big production where they where they brought in like zoo animals and stuff and this Noah's Ark thing in and, and the church and, and they worked on it and it was almost done with it and they came in that night he walked in the back door and he looked at his wife and he said, you know, because he had a big hand in it he said, you know, this place wouldn't run without me. A week later he was working on a treehouse for his little girls and his boy and he fell out of it and hit his head on a big boulder and it almost killed him. They didn't think he was going to live, and then when they decided he was going to live, they said, well, they'll never talk again. And they said, uh, well, he, he, okay, he's able to say a few words, but he'll never walk again. And pretty soon he's up walking, and I mean, he's functioning. He functions. But then they thought he was going to die. But you know what? God taught him a lesson. Don't think that you're bigger than you are. It's not good to feel self-important. Amen? And there's nobody more important than anybody else in the family. God, I don't care if you're the preacher, you're the one that... that, that that, that teaches a Sunday school class, or you the person that empties a trash can and changes baby diapers. It don't make no difference. Everybody in this thing works together. We are part of a church, amen, a group of believers. Amen. Verse 18, he said, But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it hath pleased him. You know, God is the one who gives abilities. God is the one who gives talent. A little baby's born into this world. And laying in the bed one day, he discovers I've got hands. Now he don't know that in 10 or 12 years he'll begin to paint with those hands and become an artist. Or that baby doesn't know that within years he'll begin to do sculpting with those hands. Or that baby doesn't know that someday he'll pick up an instrument or sit down at the piano and become a, a very uh, influential musician. You know, again, a baby discovers his hands, and we've all got hands, but again, God gives some talents he doesn't give to others. But what a thrill it is when, when, when you discover your gift. And it, you know, it's not enough just to discover your gift that you have. Then you begin to develop your gift that you have. Once you discover you have it, you work at it, you, you, you exercise it until it becomes good, and then you deploy that talent. You put it to use for God. That's why God gave us what He gave us. And believe you me, whether you want to whether you want to agree with what I'm about to say or not, it's true. Every person in here, not only that, every person listening.
listening to me on Facebook, every person listening to me on Blog Talk Radio, every person who's tuned in through iTunes or wherever, however else they found us, every person who has been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, every person who is a member of the family of God has a talent that God has given you that you can use for God. Everybody. God didn't make junk. God didn't make scrap. God made you, and He gave you some kind of talent that you can employ in the service of God. You say, well, I don't know what it is. Just because you don't know what it is yet doesn't mean you don't have it. So well, what do I do, preacher? You pray about that. If you say, I don't know what, I don't know what God do, will do with me, go to praying. Say, God, I'm starting today. I'm going to pray until you show me what ability I have that I can use for you. If you'll do that, God will, God will meet you there. I promise you. I promise you. <clears throat> God has set the members, every one of them in the body, as it hath pleased Him. God, hey, you know what? God could have given us ten hands, couldn't He? God could have given us forty legs. We've been all living, walking down the street with Him. But God could have made us all different ways. He could have. God had a plan for that, and God designed it the way He wanted the body to be constructed and the way He wanted it to function. And God has the very same kind of plan with His church. It's precious to Him. We are His church. It's His, not ours. It's His. And so God has a plan to put this thing together. God, do you think that God wants churches to kind of halfway function like a broke down car? I don't think so either. I think God wants the church to function like a well-oiled machine and, and, and do His will and accomplish His will in this world. And I believe that God put it together right, but we're not looking at it right. We're saying, I can't, I can't, I can't, I don't know, I, I doubt, I don't know. We need to look at Him and trust. We need to get our eyes on Jesus, amen? But again, and making excuses and, 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 and saying, well, I'm not as good a Christian as so-and-so. I can't do what they can do. I'm not as talented as them. Every single person has a ministry. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. You just haven't found it yet. Everybody, every believer has a ministry. He says, but now... No, I'm sorry, verse 19. And if they were all one member, where were the body? Again, he's saying, listen, hands, they're important, but they're not the most important. Eyes are important, but they're not the most important. You've got to have all the parts working together. But now are they many members? Yes, but one body. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. I can sum this up very quickly and we can go to the house. You need church. And the church needs you. This is how God designed it to work. God designed it for His people to come together and work together and serve alongside one another and help one another and encourage one another and work together as the hand feeds the mouth and the hand carries the body to places it needs to go and the eyes see things and the ears hear. They all work together. And when they all work together, there's a purpose and there's function. And when the church works together, when we all have the same vision, we all see the same thing, we all hear the same thing, we all move toward the same thing and we accomplish. God, you know, the thing of it is, <coughs> God likes diversity. That's something we, we need to understand. You know, man, I've noticed this, uh, you know, just going through life, this, uh, being, a, being a part of a Christian school when I was a little kid, and, and seeing, seeing us, especially, I, you know, you see at Christian school uniforms where they all, they all dress alike, everybody looks just alike, and you see it a lot of times with like a North Korea, they dress everybody just alike, they put them all in little uniforms and everything. Catholics, they dress all the little girls just alike, all this uniformity. We've got to all conform. That's not how God works. God makes so many different flavors of people. Again, case in point, last week, Crooklyn Mary, they, they're different from me 
me and you. They eat different, they talk different, they look different. But they're just as much a believer as you and I. God, God's got different. You know, again, we could go to China today and we'd find some believers there. We could go to the, to the most Muslim of countries and we'd find some believers there. And they'd all look different. They'd eat different. they dress different. Their culture's different. But they're, but, they're, but they're still the same in Christ. Amen? And when we realize we're, such, we're part of such a big family, that God's got all of us, and God's got a plan for all of us, and God's got His hand on all of us, and God's working in all of us, and God can do tremendous things with all of us, especially right here in this church in Clarksville, Texas, if we would all realize that even though we're different and even though we're all at different levels, God can mesh all that together and do something wonderful and incredible. But we're going to have to be together on it. And I'm going to close with this verse, and y'all know it. <clears throat> From Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. The Bible says, well, let me back up one more verse. Actually, let me back up two more verses. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. Yes, God has placed us into the body. God, we're saved because we believe in what Christ has done. So let us hold fast to that. In other words, let's not be wishy-washy. Let's not be in and out. Let's, get, let, let's realize how late the hour is. Let's realize that we're, look, we're, we're, we're standing on the precipice of eternity. Let's remember that. We're not just, listen, we're not just sailing along not worried about anything. The world is closing in. Things are changing quickly in America. And you and I, we need to draw nearer to God in this hour than we ever have before. In verse 24, he said, And let us consider one another. Again, we're the part of the body. We need to be, we need to be concerned about one another's well-being. Let us be concerned, uh, consider it, uh, I'm sorry, let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Let's encourage one another to work together and to keep going for Christ's sake. Let us, let's, let's constantly be encouraging one another to be in church. Let's constantly be encouraging one another to, to, to stay in our Bibles, to be praying one for another. We need to constantly encourage one another. It's not nagging, it's encouraging. Amen? And we ought to take it as encouragement. And the last verse here I want to hit is verse 25, which says, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is. Can I tell you something? God doesn't want Lone Ranger Christians. My hand... If someone would come up here this morning and take an axe and chop it off, and me take a few steps back and look at it laying there, well, that's still my hand. But it ain't going to do me a bit of good anymore, is it? Detached from the body, the hand is going to die. Amen? Until you cut my leg off, lay it up on that table. It's, it's going to die too. Detached from the body, a part of it will die. And when you take any Christian and you keep them out of church, their spiritual life dies. They may say, oh, I get all the Bible I need right at my kitchen table. I've heard that so many times. You know, he said, well, I can meet with God anywhere. I can get out in a boat, get in the middle of the lake. I can meet with God out there in some peaceful and quiet. That's my church. That's what a guy, a fellow told me. He said, there's a spot up there at Red River, right there north of Powerly. He said, I can go up there and sit on a rock. That's where I have my church. Well, you can say all that, but that ain't the way God tells you. You know, again, I, I, I can stay home. I stay home and get my church. I watch it on the TV. Okay? Well, mom gets sick, winds up in the hospital. Why don't you call that TV preacher and see if he'll come down there and see you, mom? Uh, you, you need somebody to bury your loved one? Call, call, call T.D. Jakes. Call, call, call Joel Osteen. Call George Myers. See if they'll come bury your loved one. They don't do that. Amen? They're not going to call you and check on you. They're not going to love on you, amen? They're not, they're not because they don't care. Because, they, listen, they're not the church, amen? Now listen, we need to be in church. We need to be a part of it. We need to feel a part of it, amen? Listen, and, and, I, and I know you, you said, preach, you beat a dead horse. Well, I, I feel like it needs to be beat, amen? Listen, hey, don't make any sense to me that someday we plan on enjoying being in heaven, but we can't enjoy coming together as God's people. That don't make no sense. None at all. 
Again, the body, the body doesn't exist when it's separated. The body doesn't exist very long. The hand and foot can't exist apart from the body. And you need church. And church needs you. Amen? I can't emphasize this enough. I brought this up Wednesday night, but I'm going to say it again. I'm not trying to set a date. I ain't trying to say I'm right. But I'm saying this. The Euphrates River is drying up. That's a fact. China and Russia are getting together on a digital currency without the United States. They have five nations in Europe or in the, in the eastern half of this world that are aligned with it. They have five nations now in the west. That's ten nations or ten kingdoms mentioned in the book of Revelation. They're going to do away with our currency once this currency is the worldwide currency. J.P. Morgan has, has uh, patented a, 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 a biometric digital currency reader uh, thing that goes in the right hand of the forehead. I'm telling you, we're living right there. We're living right there. Let me give you something else a little scarier. The UN has just renewed a seven-year peace agreement. And it goes into effect, according to what I heard, and I could be wrong, but this is what I heard. It goes into effect the day after the Feast of Trumpets, which is, which is September 15th through 17th, the time of this revival meeting. Now, the Feast of Trumpets, we're waiting on the what? The trumpet. I know it happens every year. You say, well, how come it hasn't happened every year? But now, all these things haven't lined up either. You say, are you sure? I don't know. I'm not positive. No, I'm not sure. Jesus, God hasn't told me it's happening this day. But I can tell you this. There ain't never been a day in, in history up to this time that's had more things lined up with it than it has this time. I can tell you this, there's there's something that the, the world powers have called Agenda 30. Agenda 2030, they want to have full total world domination by 2030. You realize it's 2023. We're seven years out. There's a seven-year peace agreement that's going to be signed. And again, go into effect the day after the Feast of Trumpets. Oh, during the Feast of Trumpets, there is, there is a, an hour that is known as the hour which no man knoweth. The Bible says no man knoweth the hour the Son of Man come. You know what? We need to be in church. We need to get close to God. We need to get things right in our life for the Lord. You say, preacher, you, know, you could be wrong. He might not be coming. It might not. But he might. And if he does, I want to be busy. I want to be serving. I don't want Jesus to catch me with my hands in my pockets doing nothing. Because when, when he calls me home, I'm going right straight from there into his presence. And I sure want to make sure I'm, I, I go close to him. Amen? You need the church. And the church needs you. We're all part of it. And let's, let's do what we can to try, to try to reach people, try to make an impact before Christ comes. I'm mindful, I'm mindful of, of the servants that Jesus talked about that were sent forth early in the day. And, and they worked all day, and he hired some more in the middle of the day, and he hired some more at the last hour of the day. He told his parable. And he paid them all a penny at the end of the day. And the ones that started early, they got mad because the ones that just started working an hour before quitting time got paid the same thing. But he, but he told them, you know, it's not for you to decide what gets paid. And what, what, what do you get from that? I get from that. Even if you just now start to serve God, it's still worth it because the reward is just the same. Whether you've been serving Him for 40 years or whether you just start today, get busy. The reward's the same. Let's stand together. Praise the Lord. We're going to sing a song of invitation. We're going to sing number 154. God's speaking to your heart today about something. Would you come and do this with Him? Come and meet with the Lord. Come and give give your all to Him. Submit to Him. Let Him have you. Let Him have your life. What you've got ain't no good without Him in it. I guarantee you that. Whatever corner you've got roped off for you, without God's presence in it, it ain't no good. And it won't serve you well. You need Him in everything. And when you let Him have every area of your life, your life gets so much better. God will bless you. But you've got to make it in the first place. Let's go to the Lord. Father, I just ask you, please, bless the invitation now. Bless the folks, Lord. I just thank you, Lord, for, for working through me, speaking through me, and using me. 
Lord, I just want to honor you and give you all the glory. And I pray, Father, that you have worked during this invitation. Holy Spirit, God, draw us to the, to the altar, Lord. I pray, Father, you just do a work in our lives tonight. We just give you the glory and the praise for all that we know it's all you. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 154.